Many Waters by Madeline Langell, Chapter 1, Virtual Particles and Virtual Unicorns. A sudden snow shower put an end to hockey practice. We can't even see the puck, Sandy Murray shouted across the wind. Let's go home. He skated over to the side of the frozen pond, sitting on an already snow-covered rock to take off his skates. There were calls of agreement from the other skaters. Denny's, Sandy's twin brother, followed him, snow gathering in his lashes, so that he had to blink in order to see the rock. Why do we have to live in the highest, coldest, windiest spot in the state? Hoots of laughter and, shout and shouted goodbyes came from the other boys. Where else would you want to live? Denny was asked. Snow was sliding icily down the inside of his collar. Baki, Fiji, someplace warm! One of the other boys knotted his skate laces and slung his skates around his neck. Would you really, with all those tourists? Yeah, and jet setters crowding the beach. And beautiful people. And litter bugs. One by one, the other boys drifted off, leaving the twins. I thought you liked winter, Sandy said. By mid-March, I'm getting tired of it. But you wouldn't really want to go to some tourist paradise, would you? Oh, probably not. Maybe I would have, in the olden days, before the population explosion. I'm famished. Race you home. By the time they reached their house, an old white farmhouse about a mile from the village, the snow was beginning to let up, though the wind was still strong. They went in through the garage, past their mother's lab, pulling off their windbreakers. They threw them at hooks and burst into the kitchen. Where is everybody? Sandy called. Denny's pointed to a piece of paper held by magnets to the refrigerator door. They both went up to it to read, Dear Twins, I'm off to town with Meg and Charles Wallace for our dental checkups. Your turn is next week. Don't think you can get out of it. You've both grown so much this year that it is essential that you have your teeth checked. Love, Mother. Sandy bared his teeth ferociously. We've never had a cavity. Denny's made a similar grimace. But we have grown. We're just under six feet. Bet if we were measured today, we'd be over. Denny's opened the door to the refrigerator. There was half a chicken in an earthenware dish with a sign. Verboten, this is for dinner. Sandy's pulled out the meat keeper. Ham all right? Sure, with cheese and mustard and sliced olives and ketchup and pickles. No tomatoes here. Bet you Meg, Meg, bet you Meg made herself a BLT. There's lots of liverwurst. Mother likes that. Yuck. It's okay with cream cheese and onion. They put their various ingredients on the kitchen counter and cut thick slices of bread fresh from the oven. Denny's peered in to sniff apples slowly baking. Sandy looked over to the kitchen table where Meg had spread out her books and papers. She's taken more than her fair share of the table. She's in college, Denny's defended. We don't have as much homework as she does. Yeah, I'd hate that long commute every day. She likes to drive. And at least she gets home early. Denny's plucked his own books down on the big table. Sandy stood looking at one of Meg's open notebooks. Hey, listen to this. Do you suppose we'll have this kind of junk when we're in college? It seems quite evident that there was definite prebiotic existence of protein ancestors of polymers, and that therefore the primary beings were not A-amino acids. I suppose she knows what she's writing about. I haven't the foggiest. Denny's flipped back a page. Look at her title, The Million Dollar Question, The Chicken or the Egg, Amino Acids or Their Polymers. She may be a mathematical genius, but she still can't spell. You mean you know what she's writing about? Sandy demanded. I have a pretty good idea. It's the kind of thing Mother and Dad argue about at dinner. Polymers, virtual particles, quasars, and all that stuff. Sandy looked at his twin. You mean you listen? Sure, why not? You never know when a little useless knowledge is going to come in handy. Hey, what's this book? It's about bubonic plague. I'm the one who wants to be a doctor, Sandy glanced over. It's history, not medicine, Stoop. Hey, why are lawyers never bitten by snakes? Denny's asked. I don't know, and I don't care. Well, you're the one who wants to be a lawyer. Come on, why do lawyers never get bitten by snakes? I give up. Why do lawyers never get bitten by snakes? Professional courtesy, Sandy groaned. Very funny, ha ha. Denny's slathered mustard over a thick slice of ham. When I think about the amount of schooling still ahead of us, 
I almost lose my appetite. Almost. Well, not quite. Sandy opened the refrigerator door, looking for something else to pile on his sandwich. We seem to eat more than the rest of the family put together. Charles Wallace eats like a bird. Well, judging by the amount we spend on bird feed, birds are terrible gluttons, but you know what I mean. At least he's settling down in school and the other kids aren't picking on him the way they used to. He still doesn't look more than six, but half the time I think he knows more than we do. We're certainly the ordinary run-of-the-mill ones in this family. The family can do with some ordinary run-of-the-mill people. And we're not exactly dumb. If I'm going to be a doctor and you're going to be a lawyer, we've got to be bright enough for all that education. I'm thirsty. Sandy opened the cupboard above the kitchen door only a year before they had been too short to reach it without climbing on a stool. Where's the Dutch cocoa? That's what I want. Sandy moved various boxes of lentils, barley, kidney beans, cans of tuna, and salmon. I bet Mother's got it out in the lab. Let's go look. Denny sliced more ham. Sandy put a large dill pickle in his mouth. Let's finish making the sandwiches first. Food first, fine. With sandwiches an inch or more thick in their hands and full mouths, they went back out to the pantry and turned into the lab. In the early years of the century, when the house had been part of a working dairy farm, the lab had been used to keep milk, butter, eggs, and there was a large churn in one corner, which now served to hold a lamp. The work counter with the stone sink functioned as well for holding lab equipment as for milk and eggs. There was now a formidable-looking microscope, some strange equipment only their mother understood, and an old-fashioned Bunsen burner over which a homemade tripod, a, over, over which on a homemade tripod, a black kettle was simmering. Sandy sniffed appreciatively. Stew. I think we're supposed to call it Buf Bourguignon. Sandy reached up to the shelf over the sink and pulled down a square red tin. Here's the cocoa. Mother and Dad like it at bedtime. When's Dad coming home? Denny's wanted to know. Tomorrow night, I think, Mother said. Sandy, his mouth full, held his hands out to the wood stove. If we had our driver's licenses, we could go to the airport to meet him. We're good drivers already, Denny's agreed. Sandy stuffed another large bite of sandwich into his mouth and left the warmth of the stove to wander to the far corner of the lab, where there was a not-quite-ordinary-looking not computer. How long has Dad had this gizmo here? He put it in last week. Mother wasn't particularly pleased. Well, it is supposed to be her lab, Sandy said. What's he programming? Denny asked. He's usually pretty good about explaining, even though I don't understand most of it. Tessering and red shifting and space-time continuum and stuff, Sandy stared at the keyboard, which had eight, rather than the usual four racks of keys. Half of these symbols are Greek, I mean literally Greek. Denny's ramming the last of his sandwich into his mouth, peered over his twin's shoulder. Well, I more or less get the usual science signs. That looks like Hebrew, and there's Cyrillic. I haven't the faintest idea what these keys are for. Sandy looked down at the lab floor, which consisted of large slabs of stone. There was a, sick, a thick rug by the sink, and another in front of the shabby leather chair and reading lamp. I don't know how Mother stands this place in winter. She dresses like an Eskimo. Denny shivered, then put one finger, then put out one finger and tapped the standard keys of the computer. Take me someplace warm. Hey, I don't think we ought to mess with that, Sandy warned. What do you expect, a genie to pop up? Like the one in Aladdin and the magic lamp? It's, this is just a computer, for heaven's sake. It can't do anything it isn't programmed to do. Okay, then. Sandy held his fingers over the keyboard. A lot of people think computers are alive. I mean, really, sort of like Aladdin's genie. He tapped out on the standard keys. Someplace warm and sparsely populated. Then he shouldered him aside, adding, Low humidity. Sandy turned away from the odd computer. Let's make the cocoa. Sure. Then he's picked up the red tin which he had set down on the counter. Since Mother's using the Bunsen burner, we'd better go back to the kitchen and make the cocoa. Okay, it's warmer there anyhow. I could do with another sandwich if they've gone all the way into town. They'll probably be, supper will probably be late. They left the lab, closing the door behind them. Hey, Sandy pointed. We didn't see this. There is a small note taped to the door. Experiment in progress. Please keep out. Uh-oh, hope we didn't upset anything. We better tell Mother when she gets back. Why didn't we see that note? 
We were busy stuffing our faces. Denny's crossed the hall and opened the kitchen door and was met with a blast of heat. Hey! He tried to step back, but Sandy was on his heels. Fire! Sandy shouted. Get the fire extinguisher. Too late. We better get out and... Denny's heard the kitchen door slam behind them. We've got to get out, Sandy yelled. I can't find the fire extinguisher. I can't find the walls, Denny's groped through a pervasive mist, his hands touching nothing. Came a great sonic boom, then absolute silence. Slowly, the mist began to clear away and dissipate. Hey, Sandy's changing voice cracked and snorted. What's going on? Denny's equally cracked voice followed. Where on earth? What happened? Was that an explosion? Hey! They looked around to see nothing familiar. No kitchen door, no kitchen, no fireplace with its fragrant logs. No table with its pot of brilliantly blooming geraniums. No ceiling strung with rows of red peppers and white garlic. No floor with the colorful braided rugs. They were standing on sand, burning white sand. Above them, the sun was in a sky so hot that it was no longer blue, but had a bronze cast. There was nothing but sand and sky from horizon to horizon. Is the house all right? Sandy's voice shook. I don't think we went into the house at all. You don't think it was on fire? No, I think we opened the door and we were here. What about the mist and the sonic boom? And what about Dad's computer? Uh-oh, what are we going to do? Denny's voice strained out in the base sword out in a bass sword and cracked to a piercing treble. Don't panic, Sandy warned, but his voice trembled. Both boys looked around wildly. The brazen sunlight beat down on them. After the cold of snow and ice, the sudden heat was shocking. Small particles of mica in the sand caught the light and blazed up at them. Hey, Denny's voice cracked again. What are we going to do? Sandy tried to speak calmly. We're the ones who do things, remember? We just did something, Denny's was bitter. We just blew ourselves here wherever here is, Sandy agreed. Stupid. We were stupid, mucking around with an experiment in progress. Only we didn't know it was in progress. We should have stopped to think. Denny's looked around at sky and sand, both shimmering with heat. What do you suppose Dad was up to if we knew that? Space travel, tessering, getting past the speed of light, you know that, anxiety made Denny's sharp. The sun beat down on Sandy's head, so that he reached up and wiped sweat from around his eyes. I wish we'd never thought of that Dutch cocoa. Denny's pulled off his heavy cable-knit sweater, licked his dry lips, moaned, Lemonade! Sandy, too, stripped off his sweater. We got what we asked for, didn't we? Heat, low humidity, sparse population. Denny's looked around, squinting against the glare. Sparse wasn't meant to mean nobody, Sandy unbuttoned his plaid flannel shirt. I thought we asked for a beach. Not on Dad's gizmo, we didn't, just sparse population. Do you suppose we've blown ourselves onto a dead planet, one where the sun is going into its red giant phase before it blows up? Despite the intense heat, Sandy shivered, glanced at the sun, then quickly away. I think the sun in its red giant phase would be bigger. This sun doesn't look any larger than our own sun in movies set in deserts. Do you suppose it is our own sun? Denny's asked, hopefully. Sandy shrugged. We could be anywhere, anywhere in the universe. If we were going to play with that doggone keyboard, we should have been more specific. I wish we'd just settled for Baki or Fiji. Beautiful people or no. We'll pause there. <clears throat> 